Hi, I'm Christopher Bruza, and I'm going to show you my long range uh, competition rifle, uh, typically used in PRS, uh, and locally here we shoot the Ambush Action uh, series. Um, this is an Accuracy International AX308 with a small firing pin. It's a short action, uh, 2.8. 2.82 cartridge overall length uh, with a 308 bolt face. So you can shoot any cartridge, it's going to fit that. You just put whatever barrel you want on it. This has the small firing pin, which came out in 2015 for higher pressure cartridges. Um, and I bought this new in 2015. You'll see the scope on it is a Schmidt and Bender. PM2 5 to 25 by 56 um, and it has a trimmer 2 reticle. So I'm going to start at the butt, move to the muzzle, and just explain features and why I chose to set it up the way it is. Okay, so this is a folding stock. I believe all the AXs are folding stocks. So the chassis, I believe you have the option. Uh, but it's a folding stock. Uh, it's very solid. Uh, doesn't move. I mean, it's, it's dead solid. When it folds, it folds over the right side to cover the bolt handle. Um, a lot of folding stocks go to the left, and then you have a much wider package because you have your bolt handle sticking out. So I use an Eberly stock pack. Um, so I fold it to the right and put this in the rifle scabbard. Uh, the bolt is protected uh, and it's a fairly narrow package. Uh, you'll see the butt pad here is adjustable. Uh, you have this thumb wheel which you can readjust it up, down, left, right, angle it, whatever you want to do. Um, I have marks on all my settings just in case something happens. I know if my screws moved, if uh, it's not set up properly. There are spacers which you can add or subtract to change your length of pull. Uh, but you can also do that with this adjustment here. It's a thumb wheel. So the spacers are your main adjustment. And then if you need to tweak it, when you're on a stage or just if you feel something isn't right or you want to make minute adjustments you can tweak it here forward and back I generally run a 13 and a half inch length of pull for a PRS gun it seems to work well for me um, moving up what we have here is just a little skid skid plate. Uh, it serves no function other than just putting your bag under it, giving you a location to put your bag. Because this, this section here is fairly high um, and you need a pretty big bag. I run a triad tactical uh, triangular bag. I've used it, I don't know, since 2012 or so and I'm just used to it. I know a lot of people have moved on to bigger, better things. It works for me, I'm not going to change it. Um, this attaches, there's a Picatinny rail under here. I guess you could put a monopod or something, but that would be completely useless in my opinion. Um, having a slightly longer one might be beneficial, uh, but this is what it comes with. Uh, a lot of times you'll see people slide these forward. The instructions say to have it all the way back. It's where it is. It works fine for me. Um, it's just a cheap molded plastic piece. Um, probably see it's all chewed up on the bottom here from, from use. Okay. There's a screw up top here that allows you to angle this cheek riser left or right. Um, and it also houses a four millimeter hex wrench. Uh, this will adjust everything on the rifle if you need to in the field. 
The exceptions are these three screws that hold the plastic on um, and the adjustment for the trigger shoe, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, this conveniently stores in the butt stock. It has a ball detent to keep it in there. It's not going anywhere. Uh, if anything, it's a little hard to get out, but I don't want to lose it. It's a wonderful. Moving up, I already mentioned the folder. Um, you have your nipple and recess, which locks the stock. Um, then you have your plastic. Uh, this is actually the same plastic that's on the AT, uh, just this trigger portion. Uh, and you have your trigger. There is a small screw in there, which is smaller than four millimeters, uh, which allows you to move the trigger forward and back uh, to fine tune where that trigger shoe sits. Um, going forward here, we have our magazine release. It just, it's a push forward. Uh, it's got a fair amount of resistance. I've never knocked a magazine out accidentally um, but it's it's a good size and it's extremely easy to just kick forward um, with your trigger hand. The magazine so the magazine on the AX is specific to the AX um, where it goes up there's a little uh, protrusion here it's just a slit in the metal that they bent out the clips and it rocks into place um, if you have a chassis uh, like the MPA chassis I know some actions are set up to take the double feeding accuracy international magazine this won't fit this uh, protrusion is going to prevent you from putting it up into the rifle uh, this rifle can use the magazines uh, from those. I believe it's the same that's used in the Arctic Warfare and the earlier models. Uh, without the detent, I've never had issue using them. They work great. The downfall to this magazine is it's 10 rounds and the base plate is welded on. Uh, so I have not seen a replacement uh, or modification you can do to get more than 10 rounds. So in a match several stages depending on the match director will have 12 rounds. 10 is less than 12 so that's a problem. That's why you see this um, short action precision cartridge holder on the side I always keep two rounds in there, and on a 12-round stage, I hand-feed the last two. Uh, it's quicker for me than a magazine change, because a lot of times on those stages, to get 12 rounds off in 90 seconds, uh, they're going to limit your movement. So you are taking two shots, moving two shots, moving two shots, moving. You might move tw two, three times max. Uh, so that means by the time you run out of ammo, your rifle is set up most likely on a bag, uh, unless it's prone stage, it's going to be on like a game changer or something along those lines. And to change a magazine out, you're going to have to pick the rifle up, move it, change a magazine, and then resettle the rifle into its position. Uh, I found it much easier to hand feed it, and there you go. A lot of people have commented over the years on this funky cutout on the magazine, on the uh, parallax non bolt side of the rifle. And this is so that when you're shooting prone, you can remove the magazine without lifting the rifle. This cutout allows you to get the magazine as well as your hand in there. From the back, where there is no cutout, I mean, you could you could do it, but it's much much easier uh, with this cutout there. That's why it's there. 
Um, you've got some slight uh, removal of material for lightning, I guess. But it's, it just makes it much easier. So moving up, we have our bolt, which the bolt release is on the left hand side and it's on the action. It's not in the trigger assembly like a 700. So you release that, it's fairly, it's very sturdy. Uh, all the forces are put on the bolt release mechanism and not on the actual pin retaining it. A lot of rifles, rifle actions uh, will put a shear force on the pin containing the bolt release. This does not do that. Um, it's a six lug bolt and it has, I guess, a longer M16 style extractor. That's what I'd call it. I don't know what AI calls it. Um, but it's fairly long. Uh, it's a push feed and the extractor pops over the edge of the cartridge. You have your ejector right there. It's a spring plunger type and you've got fluting to take up any grit or anything in the action. And here is your safety assembly. So it's a three position safety. So it's a three position safety. All the way forward is fire. Middle position, you can work the bolt, remove the bolt. And if you're actually gonna remove the firing pin assembly, you put it in the middle position, remove the bolt, push in this plunger, Turn it and the firing pin assembly and safety comes out. So middle position, you can work the bolt all the way back, locks the bolt in place and everything is safe. Um, again, in the middle position it's safe as well, but uh, this it locks everything. I wish my hunting rifles had that, um, but they don't. Um, I don't know if anybody makes replacement bolt handles. I have never had issues with this or thought to replace it. It's fairly slick, um, and once in a while if I'm shooting without gloves, my hand will pop off this if I'm getting a bit antsy and not taking my time with fluid motions. Uh, so my hand has popped off it. I don't think I've timed out or anything because of it. Normally when I shoot, I wear gloves, uh, even in the summer because we have matches in the winter. I do a lot of hunting and you're going to wear gloves for that. So I want everything to be consistent. So I wear gloves in the summer. Um, I wear pig gloves and they're great. Uh, I've just gotten used to shooting with them and it feels funny when I don't. I actually carry a spare bolt in my rifle case uh, instead of a backup rifle. I used to carry a Remington 700 in 260 Remington in an Accuracy International chassis with the same scope, uh, well, this black version of this, same radical, everything, <clears throat> same mount, same setup, and that was a complete waste. I have over 10,000 rounds, close to 11,000 on this rifle. I have not had one single failure. Nothing. I haven't had to replace a part, anything. Uh, it's been amazing. So I sold that rifle 
and I ended up picking up a spare bolt because if anything breaks on this, I'm projecting it's going to be a firing pin breaking or a firing pin spring, uh, or possibly an extractor cracking. All of that's housed in the bolt assembly. So I bought a spare bolt. I've never used it. I will, when I put a new barrel on and check it with go, no go gauges, uh, I will check it with a spare bolt. But this head spacing on this bolt is about two thousandths of an inch greater than on my spare bolt. So as long as it closes on a go gauge, I'm good. The spare bolts are very pricey. Uh, it's close to $900 for a bolt assembly. Uh, and I haven't found them in the different colors. My spare one is black. I don't ever plan on using it. And I'm sure I could sell it to somebody who has one with a large firing pin hole. So the action on this is actually made out of square stock um, and it has a recoil lug just behind this screw uh, that it in the action is epoxy into the chassis you cannot remove this action from the chassis it's glued in uh, if you do want to remove it to put an aftermarket chassis on there which I don't know why on earth anybody ever would you have to heat it up uh, and break the epoxy free. So, like the action is epoxied in, this Picatinny rail is epoxied on and it's screwed, pinned, and epoxied. You see I have marks here for where my different scope bases go, where my dope card goes, and this is a 20 MOA rail, um, no problems with it. I mean, it, it's epoxy to place, it's not going anywhere. So that brings us to the scope mount. I'm checking the number. Uh, it, it's a spur SP4602. This is a six mil can't on the scope mount. It's a spur with the bubble level. Um, I don't have any accessories on it. One thing I do is I change out these screws uh, for socket head cap screws because they're M5 and this four millimeter hex fits those. So if I need to, if it comes loose, uh, which hasn't happened, but if something happens, I need to remove the scope. I can't. Um, moving on to the scope. Again, Schmidt and Bender PM2 5-25 to by 56 With a Tremor 2 reticle illumination. The MTC uh, elevation turret. Uh, locking windage turret. Parallax on the left side. Uh, as you can see, one turn. And then when I start to hit my second rotation, you're going to see a uh, protrusion extend on the top, telling you you are on your second rotation. So here we go, we're at 20 mils. And I'm there. Uh, sorry, I, I incorrectly say that before. It's not 28 mils of elevation. It's about 27. Uh, it stopped short. This is the MTC elevation knob. I believe it's more tactile click. Uh, whatever they call it. It every tenth of a mil, you can kind of see it stops on its own. It has a much bigger detent. So you can feel every click. So those whole numbers, uh, it's a bigger click. And the criticism of this turret is if you're trying to go, okay, right now I'm on eight mils. 
if you're trying to dial to 8.1 mils and you turn it up it's gonna probably stop around 8 because you're slowing down to, to stop your turning uh, if you try to hit 8.1 because 8 has a larger detent you kind of shoot past that 8.1 and right there I just shot to 8.3 so I stopped at 8 turned it again 8.3 which I, I don't see a problem with because you just turn it down too. You're going to look at the number. We aren't shooting in the dark uh, and going by feel. Um, but I guess it's a fair criticism. Right there, just turned to 8.2. So whatever. Uh, I usually hold over. I don't have a problem with it. I would prefer this. I've owned the other turrets. I've owned the traditional double turn, single turn. Posicon, I think that's about it. So I prefer this. It's what I seek out when I buy a scope. Uh, moving back, we have our illumination. Uh, 11 levels of illumination. And it illuminates most of the reticle, not all of it. Um, the main crosshairs are illuminated. And I believe you have dots on some of the wind uh, wind marks. I don't shoot in the dark. I've done night matches. They're lit enough to see the reticle without illumination. Uh, moving back, you have your zoom. And I generally shoot, unless it's just something that's going to go out to... 1400, 1500 yards, I'm shooting on 12 power. Unless I'm zeroing or it's the like Accu shot challenge, whatever it is where they put the playing cards out and you have to hit this person closest to the center wins a $300 gift card. If I'm spotting for somebody, I'll turn it up. Uh, spotting through the rifle. Like uh, a lot of times prone stages, they will lay out uh, three or four shooters at a time and one shooter goes the next shooter and, and so on and when you're laying there uh, you can get on the rifle and spot the other shooter I'm definitely gonna turn up 25 power for that back off my parallax slightly and try to get their trace going into the target so I can see what the wind is doing it's also great if they hit the dirt around the target you're going to see where that dirt goes how quickly it moves if they do hit the steel target makes a puff of smoke you're going to watch how fast that moves and the reason for that is I run a Tremor 2 reticle the Tremor 2 is designed by Todd Hartnett and accuracy first. It has wind dots based on elevation. They figured out that for most competition rifles with the DC bullets we're shooting, velocities we're shooting, they figured out that wind is fairly proportional to drop. Uh, for one cartridge it might be 3.92. I can't read wind to that precision. So it's a quick and dirty uh, solution, but it works great when you're on the clock. Now, if I were in some sort of competition where you needed to hit the bullseye, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use them. But on the clock, I'm holding over, I'm using those wind dots. So I'm, a lot of guys are thinking of wind and tenths, and their experience builds up on tenths of a mil. I'm looking at wind in miles per hour. That's the input to most ballistic programs, and it's what I'm thinking of. So you find your wind on the first target, and you just run it down the reticle for your further targets and keep smacking steel. Generally works. Uh, yesterday I was out practicing, had a crosswind where my 800 yard target. It was a 8-inch blade, 800 yards, not quite an MOA. Uh, 
I was holding about a five, close to six mile an hour wind to hit that target. When I moved out to 900 and 1,000, just due to the way the range is cut, um, there was a crosswind, and it was more of a two mile an hour hold, which completely blew my mind. So this is a fast focus eyepiece. You turn it left, right. Um, it's fairly easy to hit and knock out of position. Um, so I make marks where the uh, eyepiece should be focused. I use Tenebrex covers. I like the way they fold down. They fold, well not flat, fairly flat. I haven't broken them. I, I used to run the Butler Creek and uh, you're always replacing them. These covers come on the PM2 3 to 20 by 50, which I have a few of, um, and they're great. So I retrofitted my 5 to 25s with them. I find that if you leave your covers down right until it's time to shoot, especially if it's raining, humid, uh, you're going to fog up your outside lenses. The scope filling, scope quality has nothing to do with the scope. It just has to do with the atmosphere. Uh, so as soon as I move to a stage, I get my rifle set up for the stage. I get my dope, I adjust whatever I need to adjust, set my bags out, and flip up my scope covers. I want them, I want the scope to have a good 10-15 minutes to acclimate. If it's raining, I will generally take them off because they are more trouble than it's worth. Your, your lenses get wet and then you're just closing them, you're locking in moisture. It's I don't mess with it. So we did the back end here. Uh, parallax, there's nothing much to talk about. It goes from about, well, the, the first mark is at 10 meters, but it moves lower than that. So I'd say, I don't know, seven meters, uh, all the way out to infinity. The mark before infinity is 1000. This scope is fairly forgiving on parallax. Um, so I will set it to a median number. Like uh, I still have on my dope card the distances from the last state I shot last weekend um, at the ambush action absolute zero sniper match. We've got 514, 613, and 695. So I would have just dialed this to about 500 and a little bit more to try to get around six. Again, it's fairly forgiving, so it's not, not much to worry about. The windage locks, so you push this in. The elevation also locks um, up and down, uh, but the windage is a single turn knob. You have clicks, but they do not stop on the one mil mark as the elevation as the elevation does. They don't have a bigger detent on that one mil mark. Uh, it's a single turn knob, so it goes to six mils and then stops. Again, you go to six mil the other direction, it stops. And there's a bigger detent on zero, which is extremely helpful. I normally keep it locked. If I dial something, it's going to be spin drift. And the reason I dial spin drift is I am using a Tremor 2 reticle. So I want to know what the true mile per hour of the wind is. If that wind curve or wind hold off is also, if I'm shooting it and it's also taking into account spin drift, the next time I see, say, a four mile an hour wind, I'm like, oh, I know this. I've seen a four mile an hour wind before, I know I hold on my four mile an hour mark, but this time it's going left to right instead of right to left. All of a sudden I'm gonna miss the target. I'm like, it's the same wind, it's just a different direction. What's going on? Well, spin drift plays into it. So I dial my spin drift. 
a lot of people don't, and I get very funny looks from people when I mention that I do. Uh, generally, within about 700 yards, I don't worry about it. It's going to be a, a tenth of a mil, um, but certainly 800 and out, I'm dialing uh, spin drift on. Um, and if there is a, like, say, 400 yard target, uh, but several beyond 800, I'm just going to know that for that 400 yard target, I'm going to have to hold off for my wind. Uh, moving forward, you will see I have a sunshade on here. It's not because of the sun. I run this for the rain. When it is raining, generally, you can wipe off the ocular fairly easy. Uh, you shoot with a hat, hood, whatever, and your hat brim is coming over it. Without this on there, I get a ton of water on my objective lens. The, the one downfall I see with Schmidt and Bender scopes is they do not repel water very well. So it completely blurs up and the water just spreads all over that lens. It's like you need to add rain X to it. Um, I've hunted with Zeiss, uh, Diavari scopes, Victory scopes, and they're great at repelling water. It Schmidt is not, so I run that uh, sun sunshade, and it keeps the water off my ejective lens. So you'll see this right here. That's my dope card holder. Um, flips up. Attach the Picatinny rail, and there's my dope from the last stage I shot at last weekend's match. Uh, I only write, if I'm doing holdovers, I only write the elevation because again, I'm using wind dots. Um, and I am looking at everything and adjusting my wind hold after every shot. So I'm doing that based on the wind dots and the reticle and this shows my elevation. Uh, it just pulls off. Um, it's like the industrial type of Velcro. Um, and I use tape. They come with a quick erase marker, and this is a quick erase material. Uh, don't do it. If you rub up against it, uh, it's, it wipes off, and I have done that and get up there with no dope. So coming around here, we have really right stuff. Um, I don't know what they call it. Uh, this foreign I, I don't know what it's called, but it's uh, made by really right stuff, and it's a Arca rail, uh, which clips onto my tripod. This is where I mount my tripod. If I'm shooting off a tripod. I'm mounting it right here, and uh, you see this ugly mark that's kind of scraped off. That's the balance point. Uh, center of mass is in line with that for my rifle. So if I throw this on my tripod, I am putting the center of the tripod right there, and the rifle will be fairly neutral and balanced. Now that's going to change when you change barrels, barrel profile, barrel length, anything like that. Um, so, you see this screw right here? That is how we change barrels. Uh, you loosen this up, and this barrel just unscrews and comes out. You put a new one in. You tighten it down, and there's a notch right here. You look in the notch to make sure everything is seated properly. And then you tighten that down to 45 inch pounds, and you are good. Uh, check your headspace. I <laughs> I was actually practicing once, and the area was gravel. I don't know how it happened. I got a piece of gravel 
stuck up in the front of my chamber. Uh, a large piece of gravel. I couldn't get it out. I didn't have a cleaning rod to go down the barrel and poke it out. So I just pulled my barrel off, took it off, everything fell out, put the barrel back in, still zeroed. I find that if it's the same barrel, it's within it about a tenth, a tenth of a mil, if you take it off and put it back on. If I'm changing barrels, whether it's the same uh, cartridge uh, or a different cartridge, it's within about half a mil max, generally 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something around there. So it's very consistent. Um, we got that. Moving forward, this is a stock fore end. Um, see, I've used it a lot. You have got an AI proprietary key mod sort of attachment system. Works with air rails. I usually shoot with slings. Uh, I don't you don't use them when shooting, like old school, wrap your, your arm up with it, but um, I do use them for carrying the rifle and securing the rifle. So you get your sling attachment points. Uh, I actually have one opposite this on this side. Um, this Picatinny rail is removable, the, the top one, it, but it's completely in line and true with the 20 MOA back here. So this tapers, um, it has holes drilled to relieve, uh, to relieve heat coming off your barrel. On the bottom here, I have a Sawtooth Rifles Arca Rail. And in full disclosure, I did not pay for this rail. It was uh, given to me. So I'm running an Atlas bipod with a really right stuff um, arca rail attachment. Uh, inside of here is actually a Picatinny adapter as well as the arca. Um, so if I wanted to take it on a different rifle and attach, it attaches to Picatinny rail and the arca. So <clears throat> benefit to the arca rail is you can slide it around wherever you need it. Uh, I can take it off, I can put it on this mount if I wanted. Uh, generally, if you're shooting something that's narrow, uh, you're going to want to move it in. I have it marked right here for the traditional barrels. Um, I can also remove this stop at the end with my four millimeter hex screw and this will then just slide right off. Um, so if you're shooting a barricade stage that starts with uh, prone, I'll take that screw out and loosen that and just knock it off uh, before moving up the barricade. It's much quicker than moving these in. And this is the Atlas bipod, the notched legs, that will go in 45 degree increments, swivels in this direction, back and forth. It's a PRS model, uh, or something along those lines. So this is a 6.5 Creedmoor barrel uh, that actually I got with the rifle. Um, I shot it at last weekend's match. Uh, simply because I had a bunch of ammo and I didn't feel like loading. It was primarily a throwaway match for me. I wasn't expecting good results. Uh, I generally shoot 6mm by 47 Lapua with a 105 grain burger bullet going about 2950 to 2970 depending on the atmosphere. Uh, I get about 1200-1300 rounds uh, usable barrel life. Um, and I'm very happy with it. It's consistent. Uh, I've thrown up the white flag and I'm not taking place in the gear race anymore. Uh, I'm sure the 6GT is a better cartridge or 
six dasher, six BRA, wh whatever, whatever you like. Uh, but this works for me. I got a bunch of brass, have the dies, bullets, everything. Um, I own the reamers, uh, finishing and roughing reamers to, to chamber the barrels. And that's what I'm going to keep shooting. Moving down to the end, I used to run a suppressor, a Yankee Hill Machine Titanium Phantom. A very quiet suppressor, great at reducing sound, um, but I found the amount this gun gets shot, I was getting a ton of buildup in the suppressor, and the carbon buildup within about three, four hundred rounds would build up and start encroaching on the hole in the baffles, and that would wildly uh, affect my accuracy. So every three to four hundred rounds, I'd have to clean the suppressor, uh, which is a big pain in the ass. Uh, I got fed up, put on a muzzle brake, and quickly discovered the muzzle brake reduces recoil much better. I mean, the suppressor does does a decent job, but uh, this is an area 419 brake. Uh, I generally run this or the APA Fat Bastard. Uh, both of them do a great job of reducing recoil. Uh, sometimes it's impolite at a range to go with a big muzzle brake, but it's, it's expected at competition. Uh, I double up my ear protection, uh, use bone plugs, and then the MSA Sorden, and... Uh, no flinch of any sort or anything like that. Uh, I've gone to the brake simply because it seems to be more reliable and consistent. And that's, that's the entire theme of this rifle is reliable, consistent, not necessarily the best, smoothest, slickest, sexiest rifle out there, but um, it works. I mean, this thing, I've shot in, you know, sleet, snow, complete downpours. This thing's just been packed with mud. I remember one of the Guardian Long Range competitions, I had to come home at night, and uh, it was a two-day match, and I put this thing in the bathtub, took it all apart, there was a ton of grit, and it, it works. Uh, dead reliable. So... That's my competition gun, Axe International AX, Schmidt and Bender PM2, and uh, that's what I think about it. Enjoy.